Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including... CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiaki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiaki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome to the Science of Magic, a place where science and magic come together to transform fact into evolving truth. We're proudly coming to you through the ever-expanding X-Zone Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, and can also be found on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring Don't Have a Wasted Life. While we'd like to think we're at the helm of our own lives, and the sad reality is, Rather than being self-directed, many of us are controlled by fear. Living in terror of lack, most of our focus is on earning enough money to be safe and provided for in our latter years. One wouldn't want to starve alone in the dark. We're taught from an early age to always take the safe route, to be responsible, to save for the future rather than live for the moment. While some semblance of reason and planning is not only advisable but necessary, We also need courage, unconventionality, and spontaneity in order to really live. Our creativity and genius lies in the untamed heart, not in mental planning or careful strategizing based on what's gone before. Countries were founded by adventurers, yet the majority of us play it safe. Shackled to jobs, relationships, and lives that bore us, we get thrills in front of a television watching others take risks and succeed watching others really live. We content ourselves with the thought that stories and characters are just fictitious, meant for entertainment purposes only. Then there are those few exceptional real-life individuals who by their very nature break from the norm. They're the mavericks, the outlandish ones, that live life by their own rules and make a mark in the world. They're the adventurers who live to the fullest and accomplish amazing things while the rest of us squander our time focused on mundania, planning and saving to retire, and then to die. 
The courageous, exceptional ones don't buy into programmed viewpoints and beliefs, but seek the deeper meaning in all things. In so doing, they step out from under the yoke of the system and the belief of the majority. They recognize that money and lack are illusions designed to control through fear. There's a well-kept secret. We are co-creators of our reality. As long as we live in fear of lack, that's exactly what we're going to create. If, however, we find the courage to embrace independent thought, we can access our ability to dream a future and then create it. If instead of playing lip service to the harsh realities of life, we stop and ask ourselves, but what if? Then we open the doors to our imagination and the ability to create. Through embracing curiosity and following our joy, each of us can break free of the fear trap. The status quo has dulled our minds and stifled our spirit. Many believe we have no more value than our material possessions. Yet we're spiritual beings made in the image of God, our spirits reaching to the edge of the universe and beyond. The only thing standing between us and our true potential is programming and fear. Like cattle complacently munching grain in the feedlot, lulled into a false sense of security by abundant food, only to be led to the slaughter, we condemn ourselves to unremarkable lives. Why settle for the mundane when we can embrace our genius? To be safe? It doesn't look safe to me. It looks like a feedlot. It looks like a wasted life. Our guest this hour, Ralph White, author of The Jeweled Highway on the Quest for a Life of Meaning, is co-founder and current creative director of the New York Open Center, America's leading urban institute of holistic learning. The Open has presented the major writers and speakers in the fields of wellness, social ecological change, inner development, world spiritual traditions, art, and creativity for over 27 years. Ralph is an international speaker on spirituality, consciousness, and the history of Western tradition, editor of the award-winning Lapis Magazine, and taught the first full accredited course in holistic thinking and learning at New York University. After this commercial break, I'll introduce Ralph, and together we'll explore the many paths to living a life of meaning. So don't go away. You're listening to The Science of Magic. Prior innovative episodes can always be found on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. The Science of Magic is produced by Relmar McConnell Media Company, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. 
Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at www.drgibbswilliams.com. This is Johanna Carroll, host of Dialogue with Divinity on the Exxon Broadcast Network. While walking along Kanapali Beach in Maui this past year, I kept discovering all these shells and coral in the shape of hearts. My Dialogue with Divinity was very simple. Do you want me to do a retreat to heal people's hearts in Maui next year? And of course, the answer was yes. As a master spiritual teacher, I am offering you a neat retreat called RISE, May 8th through the 12th, 2017, and the chance of a lifetime to rest at a five-star resort for five days and experience a spiritual renewal of your heart and soul. Kanapali is one of the top five beaches in the world. This stunning resort has undergone a $40 million renovation. I walked the entire property, checked out the room choices on your behalf, and I must say it is stunning. Our conference room faces the ocean with sliding glass doors. Maui is known as Mother Maui because it is a soft, gentle, healing energy. In the embrace of Mother Maui, you will feel yourself rising from the limitations of an ordinary life to an extraordinary journey of peace, bliss, and harmony a greater sense of clarity. Our RISE retreat ignites renewal in the sacred elements of air, water, earth, fire, and wind. There's plenty of free time to enjoy all that Maui has to offer. A small deposit is required now to reserve your space as this retreat, it will sell out. For more details, please go to johannacarroll.com and register today. Aloha, and I'll see you in mystical Maui. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Ralph White, author of The Jeweled Highway. Ralph, after completing a degree in American studies at the University of Sussex, came to the United States from Britain. He was a program director for Omega Institute of Holistic Studies in Rhinebeck. He's taught and lectured in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom, Russia, and Poland. His website is ralphwhite.com. Dot net. Ralph, thank you so much for joining us on The Science of Magic. Wow, it's my pleasure. Lovely to be here. Yeah. So let's start out with what do you consider a life of meaning to be? Um, well, yeah, let's get uh, stuck into the big questions. <laughs> uh, well, uh, what do I consider a life? I guess it's a life that is fulfilling, that speaks to your own uh, deepest values, where you're not just in that uh, feedlot that you were mentioning in your preface there, uh, where you have the chance to uh, make a mark on the world, and you have to, a chance to express your deepest vision and values uh, in a way that uh, is significant and uh, conforms to whatever creative objectives you may have in mind. Mm. Mm. I could, yeah, and I think that's one way to approach it. You know, it seems there's always something that drives us to a quest for meaning. What was yours? Sorry, I missed that. We just lost, uh, uh, drives me to what? It seems there's always something that drives us for a quest of meaning. Uh, what, oh, what drivers was your... for a quest. Yeah. Yes, well, uh, my, what drove me, well, I think from an early age, from just being a child, a nine or ten year old, I did always have those basic questions. What are we doing here? What is the point of it all? And is it all just to uh, grow up, get a job, get married and, and die? Um, so I was always looking for some kind of deeper purpose. And so for me, that involved the whole um, a quest, a spiritual path. So uh, I, I think I had those 
deep existential questions that uh, were in search of some kind of an answer. And that's what led me to the journeys, travels, activities, and so on that I've been involved in. You, you know, it seems to me like there are those that have that driving urge behind them, and then there's others that really don't. Have you noticed that? And what do you think makes the difference? Well, this is, a, you know, some people would say it's genetics, wouldn't they? Other people would say that it is the nature of our individual souls. Uh, you can take all kinds of different positions. I personally would uh, would go more with the latter view. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're all we all have different beings. You could argue that we all have different karma, and uh, we are drawn to various paths and activities, or the answers to ver- seeking the answers to various questions, according to our own innate predisposition, and uh, and to our own destiny. Mm. So have you personally found meaning? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I can say I, uh, I can't complain. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, because I've been involved in the whole realm of uh, holistic learning through most of my adult life. But yes, the first 26 of years of my life, particularly, oh, you know, after leaving home at 18 until, yes, until about 26, that, that, those seven or eight years there were, were a real quest for me on multiple levels, intellectual, spiritual, geographical. Um, but I did arrive at a conviction that uh, we do live in a spiritual world. And not only that, but that our society um, has been and continues to be in large measure, although we're seeing positive signs in some areas, uh, intent upon a, a self-destructive bent. And that it, it is essential to create a more holistic and ecological world and society. So. My personal sense of meaning has come from contributing to that larger vision of a transformed culture bit by bit. And uh, it's been very gratifying to see that many positive elements are happening as part of that. And for me, on a more personal, subjective level, I would say, uh, yes, I mean, I've come to a, a spiritual view of the world which has been with me now for a long time, over 40 years. And it it ain't going anywhere, and uh, that's the way I've lived my life. It's provided me meaning, coherence, and direction, and uh, I'm likely to stick with it for uh, the rest of this life. (laughs) That's something to look forward to instead of just retiring and dying, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So have you found that um, meaning evolves over time? Meaning evolves. Well I, well, I could say fresh levels of meaning appear. You know, you might begin with a meaning, uh, just finding a sense of meaning in terms of your own, your own personal path through life or um, who you are as a human being or who you are as a spiritual being. But then the more you get involved in different initiatives and activities, then you can find meaning through all of those, whether it's social, ecological, cultural, you know, whatever domain you, you may apply yourself to and whatever initiatives you're seeking to foster, then you can find great meaning through the impact that they have on the world. So let's say through the New York Open Center, you know, we've been fortunate in being able to serve or provide, hopefully in many cases, beneficial or even life transforming programs to over 300,000 people. So, uh, yes, you could say that there's a fulfillment in doing that or in doing this. Uh, I just came back from Iceland from a, a 21-year conference series I've done on the uh, some of the Western spiritual traditions that are half forgotten. I, I find great fulfillment in that. So... Yes, I think meaning does become multidimensional the more we, we become engaged with the world. The more we become engaged with the world, the more we become engaged with ourselves, and then it opens up yeah. our multidimensionality. Yeah, yeah? exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, do you, what do you think stands between most of us and living a life of meaning? Well, I think you put your finger on it there in the intro. I, I think a lot of people are, uh, unfortunately, uh, inhibited by fear, um, inhibited by our cultural conditioning that life is about primarily the acquisition of material goods or you know concerned with safety um, rather than being willing to take a chance uh, of course some you know it depends on your life circumstances but uh, and you may it may simply be essential for you to put bread on the table and provide shelter for your family and obviously that takes 
first priority and you can find meaning in that. Um, but if you have some of the basic things taken care of, as Abraham Maslow taught us many moons ago, um, there is that self-actualization dimension. And uh, I think that that is that's essential for many of us. So what advice do you have for our listeners? Say they find they're one of those people that's kind of stuck in fear. How, how can they start to move out of that and find meaning? Mm, well, it's a good question. I mean, take a chance. I mean, just look inside your own heart and see what would you really like to do? You know, do you have some unlived dream? Uh, something you've always really wanted to do, but somehow haven't got round to. Uh, do you really want to leave this world or even get through the next decade without at least having a shot at it, even if it doesn't work out? So I would say, you know, look inside yourself, see what ambition, say ambition in an egotistical way, but what desire to express yourself or to contribute to the world or whatever it may be that lives powerfully and maybe has lived inside you for a, a number of years or decades and say, look, maybe it's the time to actually give it a whirl. Um, try it. Step outside the normal and um, do something fresh and new. Take a chance. Take a risk. Mm, boy, it's about risk, isn't it? You know, what? what? You brought up something interesting about imagination and dreams. What do you think imagination and dreams have to do with engaging a life of meaning? Well, from my perspective, uh, the, the world of imagination and dreams would be a, a means through which the deeper aspects of our consciousness, uh, the soul, to use a familiar language there, um, there are ways through which the soul can speak to us in our everyday personality and our everyday awareness. So whether it is uh, an active imagination, a daydream, as it were, uh, or whether it is literally a dream that you wake up with, it could be both or either. Um, but I think they are harbingers of elements that are going on at a deeper level of our psyche. And uh, I think if we pay attention to them, I, I, you know, I'm somebody who never really had no choice in these areas. They, those feelings were so powerful in me, I could never have just... Um, bought into the established path through life if that really were in terms of just conventional job family career etc i was never that was never going to be sufficient to me but uh, i think for many people you know it depends what your obligations are but if you've reached the point in your life where you can actually uh, step outside the box then, uh, then give it a try. Uh, and I think the, uh, dr the intimations, the feelings, the consistent yearnings that live within the soul are a very strong guide to how to do that. Do you think we come with, um, you know, uh, a programming, if you will, from when we decided to come in this time that kind of drives us in this direction? Is that part of where these dreams and promptings are coming from? Yeah, my personal view is yes. I do think that is the case. I think we do come into this world with a certain overall pattern of uh, destiny. Perhaps not in all the details, but uh, a certain soul yearning that matures and unfolds in us as we grow older. And that, that provides, uh, it provides us with a certain temperament, a certain predisposition, a certain way to respond to factors and uh, experiences in the world. Um, and, uh, yeah, that is my view. I don't think we are just the proverbial tabula rasa, the blank slate, as uh, materialistic thinkers and psychologists would uh, present it. I, in my experience, that is not the case. I think we do all have a, a different soul and a different destiny, and we come in with those predispositions. Do you think there's past lives involved in this? I do, personally. I mean, I'm, I, I wouldn't go uh, trying to convince anybody of it. I think that's something that we all have to come to individually. But yes, we in the West tend to assume that it's only, what should we say, New Age space cadets and so on who could buy into such a sort of a ludicrous view of reality. But it's, <laughs> it's actually a very culturally arrogant view because we have hundreds of millions of Buddhists, Hindus, and so on uh, throughout the world who... Uh, who have subscribed to this worldview for millennia. So there's nothing particularly uh, insane or crazy about it. It's actually 
I don't know if anybody's ever done the statistics, but it's a very significant portion of the world's population that would subscribe to a view of reincarnation. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, uh, my my son spoke to me when he was oh, four years old of a past life he'd had, just as a matter of fact, and I went, whoa, that opened my eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, on the other side, we're going to have to take a break here pretty soon, but on the other side, I'd really like to, to get deeper into, you know, past lives, purpose, and possible soul teams. Who did we come to work with? Did we come to work mm. with someone? How do we recognize mm. them? You game for that? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Hey, Ralph okay. and I will Ralph and I will return to our discussion after this short break. We're coming to you through the land of leading edge paranormal broadcasting, the X Zone Broadcast Network. Don't miss the other fine shows and hosts on XZBN.net. You're listening to the Science of Magic, the Science of Magic.net. I'm Golda Wieka. We will be back, so don't you go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president 
of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Ralph White, author of The Jeweled Highway, on the quest for a life of meaning. Ralph, before we went into the break, we were talking about um, past lives, what we decide to come in with each time as far as our drive to accomplish something. And then I added the factor of, are there people that we've kind of made an agreement to work with uh, lifetime to lifetime? So I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Well, I've certainly had a sense of familiarity. You know, in my book, I describe an experience I had when I uh, <clears throat> came across the Findhorn community, now an echo village in the north of Scotland back in the mid-70s. And I had that sense uh, one dark, snowy night uh, in 1975 of entering the community center there and having an immediate sense of familiarity, even though involved involved 150 or so people in that room, I had only ever laid eyes on one before. And uh, here we are, 40 years or whatever it is later, and I'm still very close friends with uh, many of the people from that time. So they're definitely people that I've had a soul connection with, and I intuited at the moment I encountered them en masse. So uh, I do think that we have that kind of uh, experience. Yes, I mean, I've had uh, certain you know, relationships, personal relationships that definitely had a sort of karmic flavor to them, uh, where we were sort of irresistibly drawn to each other. So, <clears throat> yes, I think when it comes to, to engaging in a specific important initiative, for instance, to bring something of value and new into the world, I think we can gather around us so we can be drawn into a kind of vortex <clears throat> Um, and uh, certain people who resonate with that, who may have some deeper soul or karmic connection, can become part of that. So, yeah, I, I've certainly I, I have lifelong friends with whom I have um, a profound soul connection. I would say that seems to me the chances are very good that uh, it stems from our previous lifetimes together. You know, you, you said something that really struck with me, and that's that synergy or resonance. So when you get people together that have like purpose, it's like with a sound wave. If you sound a sound wave at a particular volume in a sound chamber, and you add another sound wave identical to it at the same volume, you get more than twice the volume as a result. Mm -hmm. And isn't it mm -hmm. that way when you're working with people that you have synergy with, and yet if you're working with people that are dissonant to you, it kind of has the opposite effect. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely the case. You know, I mentioned this 20-year uh, series of esoteric quests, as we call them, um, these conferences on the Western esoteric tradition that I've been doing. There's a, and there's a team of three of us at, at the heart of that, and we have a, um, just an outstanding synergy between us. We complement each other so well, and we are able to accomplish far more uh, when the three of us work together around a, sh a, a shared goal that we all believe in than we ever would be able to do uh, just working separately. So, yes, I, and I think it's this, um, and th that synergistic phenomenon is especially powerful with people that you really do have a deep soul connection with. And whenever I, I can't speak so well, well, I've certainly been in situations where I didn't feel a connection with the people I was around, <laughs> and that is definitely counterproductive. I can say that definitively. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that dissonance is no fun at all, is it? <laughs> no. 
you've done, you've, you should have done a lot of things um, in your bio and, and elsewhere. I've noticed that you've really accomplished a lot and done a lot of different things. What drove you to engage in so many different areas? Well, I just, uh, it, I just did with, with whatever came up next. <laughs> I mean, by the time, by the time I was, uh, I was 26, you know, I'd arrived at a holistic and ecological and spiritual worldview. So I was looking for something to do. I could also see that uh, Western industrial civilization was fundamentally on a misguided track. It was deeply damaging our souls in many ways, and it was deeply damaging the environment and the biosphere as well. And that we had to create an alternative. So having had that insight, which came out of, you know, spending a, a year or two in South America in the Andes, um, and then seeing Western civilization again with fresh eyes, uh, it, it's a question of where do you begin? And what attracted me, say, to the Findhorn community in Echo Village up in the north of Scotland was that it saw itself as a center of demonstration, that you can actually demonstrate that it is possible to live together in a largely harmonious way and in a largely harmonious relationship to nature. So I like the idea of being part of an initiative that demonstrates that to the world rather than just talking about it. And then, uh, you know, when I was uh, program director of Omega Institute for Holistic Studies in upstate New York in Rhinebeck, um, that was something that somehow fell into my lap. It was, uh, I, I describe more in the detail, in, the, in more detail in the book, how that actually happened. It certainly wasn't something I was planning on. There was, there was no way to plan on, on it. Um, it was just a, a de fate, destiny, whatever you are, karma, whatever you care to call these things. But that just seemed really important that we should have a major center for holistic consciousness uh, in the eastern United States that could bring in the top quality presenters and uh, and serve as a real vortex for consciousness change. And similarly, when uh, another set of uh, synchronicities led me to start the New York Open Center in uh, downtown Manhattan back in 1984, uh, that was just a series of, I met this person and that person, the door opened in that direction. And of course, the conventional wisdom 30-odd years ago was that something like that would never work in New York, that... Uh, that it, it was some kind of daydream, you know, to get out of here. You know, this is this is the real world in New York 30 odd years ago. Really was a very, um, should we say, a, a very chaotic and dangerous, uh, out of control place. And so people really thought it was not feasible to do something like that. Maybe California, maybe Hawaii, but not New York at that time. <laughs> and yet we've seen that that's certainly not the case. And in fact, New York really needed it. And there were scores of thousands of people who were thrilled that at last New York City had a major center for consciousness. Um, so, uh, you know, in a sense, I've, I've done what life has put in front of me. Sometimes I've had my own impulses, you know, like when I hitchhiked to Machu Picchu when I was 23. I just, I saw that picture of it and I just had an immediate yearning to go. And um, so that was something that just uh, seeing that, image of Machu Picchu on television all those years ago just galvanized in me a soul impulse, shall we say. Mm -hmm. you, know uh, what, you know what I'm seeing here, Ralph, is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like the difference between you and a lot of other people is A, you recognize the synchronicities, the spontaneous promptings, and B, you act on them. How can somebody start to recognize those? Well, how can somebody start to recognize those? I, you know, I mean, you could, I'm not sure I have any especially insightful answer around this, but I mean, it's things like meditation. Uh, it's things about having some kind of practice where you can slow down enough, where you're not, it doesn't have to be meditation per se, it could be just long walks. Um, it could be taking the dog for a walk by the, uh, by the riverside, uh, but just something that takes you into a more contemplative state where you can, where you can hear your inner promptings, where you're not so caught up in the rush and the stress. And of course, now for us today in the digital world, the relentless barrage of data that we get every time through our cell phones and our iPads and our laptops and, you know, the constant information that comes at us. I think this is why we're seeing a, ri a great rise in the uh, interest in retreats for people. People are desperate to get away, have some quiet time, some silence, slow down, and listen to what their own heart is telling them. So, you know, that's what comes to mind for me, just to try to find 
periods of time, even if it's not a daily meditation practice, but just something, you know, go to the mountains or spend a couple of weeks by the ocean if you can, and uh, allow give give yourself the time and the space for the, the, the deep soul yearnings that live in your heart to become accessible to you. So time and space for your soul yearnings to emerge, and you then you can recognize them. We just keep yeah. ourselves too busy and distracted by the mundane. Well, we do, and you know, of course, we're living in a culture that is increasingly frenetic, where we're constantly bombarded with information. So, I think it's especially important that we do this at this time. It really is. And why do you think it's more important at this particular time? What do you think is going on? Ah, uh, well, um, I think in a way where, if you look at the whole question of technology, we are we are faced with a choice, with a struggle, really. Are are the machines and computers going to mechanize us or are we going to humanize and spiritualize them or finding the right balance between those two things? I think there's a danger of us becoming, developing an overly mechanized consciousness where uh, people start to think there is no such phenomenon as the soul, that we're all just a mass of data, that we're just human computers, you know, we're just sort of some wet hardware. And uh, I think there is, you know, a deeper danger, um, and it ties into all kinds of streams of materialistic thinking, whether it's materialistic science or, or materialistic philosophy, that would argue that there is no such thing as the soul, that all consciousness are, are derived simply from the brain. So I think it is important, I think it's one of the reasons I do these programs on spirituality, on the Western esoteric tradition, to see that there's a long, distinguished, beautiful, and brilliant tradition of uh, understanding of uh, deeper aspects of consciousness, the mind and the soul. So I think that's one one of the factors that's going on right now. And of course, you know, we all, uh, the, the world is moving in a desperate direction, whether it's global warming or wherever it may be. You know, we're, we are in need of some uh, profound changes here. We can't just keep on going on business as usual. Global warming is the most um, visible and palpable uh, dimension of it, but there are many other dimensions as well. So I think we're living in a time where more and more people need to wake up to the true values that live in their hearts and souls and start creating homes, societies, cultures, wherever it may be, that are reflective of what is needed in the world right now. Uh, some uh, A life and individuals and lives and communities that are in resonance and harmony with that larger reality. It's, it's such a beautiful point, Ralph, because, you know, we can't go back to indigenous ways. There's just too darn many of us. Mm -hmm. And we can't go on like we are. So really, yeah. we need something, that third option, and only the creativity of the individual is going to come up with that, don't you believe? Yeah, I, yes, I do. I think it's up to each one of us. Somebody's not necessarily going to tap us on the shoulder and point us in the direction and say, go and do that. It's going to arise from within our own hearts and our own deepest feelings and from our own intelligence and our own awareness of what we see going on in the world and how we can be vehicles for healing and for love and hopefully for wisdom in the world. Boy, there's no greater service, is there? And nothing no. has been more needed than that right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So vehicles for love in the world. When we get back, I'd like to talk about how our Earth connection can help us be vehicles for love in the world. Okay. <laughs> Ralph and I will be back shortly. You're listening to The Science of Magic, thescienceofmagic.net, the place where altruistic professionals of science and the esoteric create common ground for the betterment of our world. We're brought to you by the leader in paranormal, spirituality, alternative health programming, the X-Zone Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. Don't miss the other fine shows on the X-Zone. As host of Dialogue with Divinity, I am thrilled to join the X-Zone Broadcast Network 
and their growing number of affiliates. My quest for a connection to the divine ignited my successful career path as an international spiritual counselor for over 40 years, an author of four books, and well-known metaphysical educator. My clients call me their spiritual mama. So my job is to offer you a radio show to help you grow spiritually with wisdom and get specific tools from guests who are experts in their field. Tune into Dialogue with Divinity and be part of the conversation with spirit. My goal, your happy soul. For more information, please visit my website at johannacarroll.com. Coming soon to the Exxon Broadcast Network is a different perspective with me, Kevin Randall, as your host. We'll be taking a close look at what is happening in the world of UFOs today with side trips into the paranormal. Guests will range from those who are household names to those who have a different perspective on a variety of topics. No topic will be taboo, but there will be tough questions asked as we all search for the truth about UFOs, the paranormal, and those things that excite us. Sometimes we'll agree with a guest and sometimes we won't, but we'll try to keep the program topical. For those of you who would like to read, be sure to visit www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and remember to listen to the other fine programs on the X-Zone Broadcast Network at www.xzbn.net. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world, I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka, and one of those gifted people of service is our guest this hour, Ralph White. He's the author of The Jeweled Highway, On the Quest for a Life of Meaning. Ralph, before we went into the break, we were talking about how we can make you know, a connection with the earth in order to create a third option for our future. Hello? Ralph? Oh, we must have been... Uh, sorry, I lo- uh, yes, I, I lost you there for a second. Okay. I was saying... Didn't hear the we... second half of the question. Okay. Yeah. We were talking about how making a, a connection with the earth and with each other and living lives of meaning, we can possibly create a third option for the future of the planet. I wondered mm-hmm. if you would speak to that for me. Well, I think this is the great challenge of our time, isn't it? I think there are, there are multiple pointers 
uh, indicators <clears throat> that we are in a time of crisis, starting off with the environmental crisis. Um, <clears throat> And it can't just be business as usual. I mean, I remember when I was a boy, an adolescent in the north of England, in the in the, uh, the places where the Industrial Revolution began, with the chimneys pouring smoke into and a whole blackened city covered in 150 years' worth of soot. We've come a long way from there. And so uh, I think, you know, from my point of view anyway, that the science is overwhelming about the necessity for us to do something about global warming and to move towards uh, renewable energy sources and uh, away from the massive emphasis upon uh, coal, uh, coal, oil, and gas. So that's one dimension. I think, you know, I think that the other dimension is the spiritual crisis of our time. Why are there so many people listening to your show or coming to the Open Center? Regardless of their own particular religious or philosophical backgrounds, I think people are feeling a, a huge sense of uh, an existential need to find something, a different way to live together, a different way to be in the world, a different relationship with their own inner selves. So, yes, I think that, I think uh, it, it's important that when we do find a spiritual path that speaks to us, and from my point of view, that it's not just about us. You know, it's not about my personal growth, my practice, whatever it may be. It's what do we, ha let's say we arrive at, so at that and uh, we arrive at certain insights, but then we have to bring it back to the world. You know, as Joseph Campbell said in The Hero's Journey, you may travel off and have many new insights, but you have to bring it back to fructify the culture. And I think each of us has to find our own individual way. We all have different gifts and talents. Uh, what individual path can we find to make the maximum possible contribution to create <clears throat> this more holistic and ecological world? So yes, to me, that is, <clears throat> that's a high imperative. And uh, it's, those kinds of values can be brought into almost every sphere of human endeavor. Mm. You know, when you were talking about, um, you know, new new solutions that's not coal and oil and this and that, you know, over the years I've heard of a lot of and been aware of a lot of very innovative new solutions that get squashed. Do you think our current society and systems are diametrically opposed to the creativity and the independent thinking that's going to create the third option? Well, there's a lot of it that isn't helpful, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> it certainly it requires an effort to to extract ourselves from the morass of a conventional opinion, and it's very easy just to be conditioned rather than to think independently. I'm not sure, you know, but I think thinking independently. Um, thinking critically, no, I don't mean gratuitously critically, but where it's merited, you know, being an independent thinker, essentially, thinking for yourself, arriving at your own conclusions, following your own values, I do think that is essential. In this age of mass media, it's, it's easier and easier just to be suckered into it. And I think with the economic stresses for so many people today as well, if they're working two jobs just to you know, put bread on the table for their family, then they have, they're exhausted. They have less and less time for this. So uh, I do think uh, there are many factors in our current society that stand in the way of this, but then it's up to us to uh, to, to get on top of whatever it is that was, would hold us back and to uh, and to make our creative contributions because there's no question that the world is in many ways in a very difficult situation um, and it has to we have to move in a healthier way boy isn't that the truth um, before we get too far into this last segment would you mind sharing with the listeners where they can find your books and services Yes, you can uh, find my book, The Jeweled Highway. Uh, I guess the easiest for most listeners would be to go to Amazon.com. This is The Jeweled Highway, uh, spelt the American way with one L, and um, by Ralph White. Uh, you could also go to the publisher's website, Divine Arts Media. The book is available there, too. You may also have it at your local bookstore. Uh, let me also say my own website, ralphwhite.net. And then uh, these esoteric quests that I've been doing for 21 years, the, the website there, esotericquest.org. Our next one will be in the Western Isles of Scotland um, next uh, next August. And then there's the, I should just say, the Open Center website too, opencenter.org. So I think those are all good ways to uh, to get in touch with my work. Well, thank you so much. Um, talk to me about spiritual awakening. How do you define it? 
how do I define spiritual awakening? Hmm. <laughs> See, I'm well, just I'm giving you the tra- I'm not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've never really thought of tra- trying to define it before, but now that you ask the question, what would you say? It's a progressive expansion of the heart, I would say. It's a calming, um, a calming of consciousness, a, a, an opening of the heart, a sense that... Um, a living, palpable sense that we are part of a much greater reality than we think we are. It's about being, you know, less absorbed with your own egotistical needs and pursuits and hopefully more engaged with a service to humanity or service to the planet. And uh, I would say it goes with, ideally, not, not every day, but on a good day, uh, it goes with a... Oh, and a tranquility in a peace. I mean, these are the objectives, of course. We all, certainly including me, become furious and disturbed, <laughs> especially living in New York City for 30 years. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's helpful to have some kind of practice. I mean, I've been meditating for a long time, so it's helpful to me. But there are so many, of course, mindful. People tend to think it's synonymous with meditation, but there are, and it's a wonderful thing, but there are many different approaches to meditation. But for some people, it could be dream work. For some people, it can be more shamanic uh, kind of things, sweat lodges and the like. There are countless, uh, countless different paths towards growth. Um, and it's reading profound material. I mean, for me, one of the great teachers who remains relatively unread is, is the great Rudolf Steiner, mm-hmm. who I think, you know, when it comes to these, some of these things we've been discussing today, karma, reincarnation, and so on, the journey of the soul after death or between death and rebirth, uh, there's an unbelievable treasure trove of wisdom there with Steiner, uh, even though people today tend to associate him with Waldorf schools and biodynamic agriculture, he certainly left a phenomenal holistic legacy. I certainly would recommend that people uh, look into that. I think he's certainly been a great source of uh, wisdom for me, and it stood the test of time. I've been deeply interested in science for 30 years. So I think, yes, the reading, just the reading spiritual books and read, try, doing what you can to read in a meditative way. So if you come across a phrase, just stay with it. You know, let it sink into you. Don't necessarily rush on. Certainly don't speed read a book. You know, reading Steiner is certainly a contemplative experience where there will be completely new thoughts that will come to you um, that you've never had before in your wildest dreams. That's a mark of a true spiritual teacher in my mind. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's what comes to mind. Hmm. So... Uh, we have a couple minutes left. How? What advice do you have for us? We're trying to live within a system and have a life of meaning and yet change the very system we're living in. What do you think we can do? What are the first steps for each individual to be able to participate in that process? Well, <clears throat> maybe the first step is really just to get to know yourself, first of all. And, you know, what do you really think? What do you really feel? What are the real impulses of will you know what are the intentions that live in your deep heart's core that's a very so give yourself the time and the space to tune into that whether it's paying attention to your dreams in the morning or just what are these soul promptings that maybe you've been ignoring for years but that keep on nagging in there inside of you maybe nagging is the wrong word but they keep on being there speaking to you and you keep pushing them aside because you don't have the time you don't have the energy or, or whatever it may be so I think the more we can get in touch with what our inner soul promptings are I think that's a great first step and then as I was saying earlier in the show you just take a risk, you know, try to bring something you truly believe in if it, uh, into manifestation. Of course, it does, you don't have to initiate something. You may be joining something. You may be, you know, helping with a natural food co-op or helping with, you know, a, an organic farm or, you know, wh- or whatever it may be. Um, but I think especially at this time when <laughs> the larger political situation might be a little out of control, but we can always... Uh, we can always focus on uh, local initiatives, regardless of the larger uh, political uh, context that we find ourselves in. So, yeah, I think just get to know yourself better and then act out of what lives, what what you are most strongly drawn to and believe in the values that, uh, that dwell in your heart and uh, do what you can to find courage to express them in the world. That's beautiful. Ralph, thank you so much for being on the show with us. We're out of time, but it's been a real pleasure. 
Thank our, you, Gwild. I've enjoyed it. Appreciate what guest, you do. Thank you, dear. Our guest this hour has been Ralph White, author of The Jeweled Highway, on the quest for a life of meaning. His website, ralphwhite.net. This has been The Science of Magic. Remember, you can always listen to that past thought-provoking episodes on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. Don't forget to join us next time on our next episode. Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge and comforted with love as you live a life of meaning.